the afternoon. I'm so happy to have you here, and I hope you have enjoyed looking at the paintings. Um, I put that up, and I want you. I I want you to read it as I talk. I hate talks that involve people putting up PowerPoint, a lot of text in PowerPoint, and then just reading off the screen. I'm not going to do it, but I want you to read it because I think um, the artist who said that said something that is very profound. He talks about the things that make people want to paint portraits. He talks about the power of the face. He talks about the power of catching the movements of the soul. That is really so insightful. And that is that captures why I paint and why my great love is painting people. Like you saw in the video just now, to me, my closest relatives are not artists who paint in a different genre, like landscape painters or whatever. To me, my closest artistic cousins are people like novelists, playwrights, actors. They are people who explore human nature and depict the conditions of man. They create characters. And that is exactly what I focus on. I, like the video said, I focus on people, uh, what people are like, things they go through. The main difference is that I do it with paintbrushes rather than with pen and paper. You can imagine that, for me, this was a very special project. Um, I, in addition to my fascination with creating great characters, I love history. And I love discovering fascinating people that have been largely forgotten. In this case, give, painting this collection, among other things, gives me a chance to bring these people before a new audience so they can be rediscovered. It's really amazing and sad to realize to what extent these great people that paved the way for the great civil rights achievement are being forgotten by everyone, including African Americans. Someone told me that Chris Rock had a comedy routine focusing precisely on that. And he would say, all right, who was it that did such and such in civil rights? And people would say, oh, that was Martin Luther King. Then he'd say, well, who was responsible for this other thing? Oh, that was Martin Luther King. Oh, well, who was the woman who wouldn't give up her seat in the bus? Uh, Martina Luther King. <laughs> Other, Martin Luther King obviously deserves enormous credit. He would have been the first to say he was not alone, and a lot of people paved the way. Another example I can give you, I happened to show my painting of Joe Lewis to a young, very athletic African-American uh, young man a few years ago. He had no idea who it was, saw nothing remarkable against him about him other than he looked at the temples and he said his hairline is receding. Well, this was somebody who in his time was probably bigger than Muhammad Ali. Uh, he was one of, of the most famous people in the country. And a young African American looks at him and he sees nothing remarkable, except marginally remarkable, that he thinks he's losing his hair. Uh, and, and that is the sort of thing that I look at and I say, this is terrible. And if what I can do, this is what I can contribute to that. Do something so that, to bring them to the attention of people, to try to prevent their being forgotten. This talk, though, is not about their lives. Um, there are other people that are suited about that. It's about the process of how I created this artwork. Nevertheless, I hope that when you saw the exhibit, you looked at all the, the text and the labels, 
and I hope that when you go home, you'll, you'll take time to look up two or three of these people because they really are remarkable and deserve uh, our attention and our respect and our gratitude. People ask me how it is that I, as a Hispanic, did a large collection of paintings of famous African Americans. Um, the answer, there's no obvious answer because that. So, uh, but it, it was just um, a sequence of events that happened to develop. I used to be do a lot of work with the organization that preceded the St. John Paul Shrine in Washington. It, it then had a different name and different leadership. And, and in fact, they had a painting of mine of John Paul on exhibit there for several years. At one point, they were going to have an exhibit of, for African American Month, and they asked me to contribute something. I happened, right around then, to go to the portrait gallery in Washington, and there was a cabinet with a small exhibit of photographs of Sojourner Truth. And I was so taken <coughs> by the face. Obviously, this was a woman of humble origins, but I saw such intelligence in her face, such wisdom, and she carried herself with such dignity. And I looked at those photographs and I said, I know what I'm going to paint for this exhibit. Everybody liked it very much and they started saying to me, I should do a whole collection. Well, that's easy to say, right? It, it is a huge commitment and I just brushed everybody off. A few months later, I decided, for some other event, to do a companion piece. Uh, I was very taken with Frederick Douglass's face, and I thought, well, I'll do a Frederick Douglass. Everyone liked that very much, too, and again, they said, you should do a whole collection. I, again, I said, no. Well, if people get after you long enough to do something, maybe at some point you change your mind and you say yes. If the commitment was every bit as long as I thought it would be, I pretty much devoted a year of, and a half of my life to this. But I'm certainly very glad, I don't regret doing this, because it was um, so educational for me, and it was like getting to know some very extraordinary people. Uh, people ask me how I choose the people I'm going to paint. First, there is a great injustice and unfairness to the fact that there are only 18 of them. I, there are hundreds of people I could have painted and that deserve to be painted, and I feel bad that it's limited to only 18, and you can imagine their practical considerations for that. I started off understanding that there were some people that had to be included. You had to include Frederick Douglass, you had to include Martin Luther King, a few people like that. Then there was a little bit of leeway, and I sought to make sure I had people from every area of life. And so, in the end, I included uh, scientists, educators, civil rights workers, um, people from the performing arts, athletes, um, a, a, a wonderful businesswoman, so that I could cover as many bases as possible. When I got down to actually starting it, I have to tell you, I don't think that 20 years prior to when I did this, I could have done it without computers and without internet. It made absolutely all the difference in the world. Um, I made some very good friends. They're known as Google Images, YouTube, and, and Photoshop. Uh, and you'll hear me refer to them. Um, I read everything I could get on these people. In some cases it was books, in some cases articles. I downloaded dozens or hundreds of photographs of the people. In the case of people from the 20th century, I watched videos of them. 
I wanted to feel, to get to feel that I knew them as people. I know what their personality was like. And I wanted to get a feel for their appearance, not a two-dimensional feel, but more a three-dimensional feel, like a sculptured needs, where you see the whole head. I worked with, uh, in, in a number of cases, with the institutions that are responsible for keeping up the patrimony of these people. Like, uh, I was in contact with the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta, um, I, with the Marian Anderson Historical Society, with the Air Force uh, Historical Research Foundation, um, with the Tuskegee Institute, um, which is now run by the National Park Service. And all of them um, sent me photographs and I asked for their assistance in some way. And, and all of them, I have to tell you, in the end, I sent them an image of the painting. And there's nothing more scary than sending an image of the painting to the organization, that's what I call the keeper of the flame, for that particular person. And each time when I've seen they email me back, my, I, I, my scar, heart skipped a beat from the time I saw it and I opened it. And I'm very happy to say that everyone, in all cases, was very happy with the painting. But I really went to even those lengths. Um, then I, I looked for photographs. And I told you that I asked for these institutions to help me. Um, I rarely found, and I wanted a photograph that really would show what I had come to believe this person was like. In a few lucky instances, I found one photo that I could mainly use, and, and that's lucky. In some of them, and you'll hear more about this, I had to pull together things like a jigsaw puzzle from a number of sources, and you'll be hearing more about that. People ask me how I approach painting. Um, I want to explain it this way. A very wise artist once created a list of factors that were needed for a painting to be good. He started out, the list began with a number of technical factors. And then he had a final one. And I'm not going to tell you yet what that was. I want to talk first about the technical things. Back at the end of the 19th century, an artistic movement began that said, well, we've always tried to make our artwork were representational artwork where we're painting things actually look like the things. You don't really have to. You can stylize them, distort them, and achieve other effects. Well, the, the, uh, something that arose from that was that that reduced the sense unique technique. By that, I mean like draftsmanship. Um, that you need a lot of technique in order to achieve, if you're painting something, to actually make it look like that something. And there was even uh, an idea that arose, well, actually, maybe technique is bad for you. If you practice a lot, that's going to kill your creativity. And that there is a superficial logic to that. And a lot of people actually believe that. Except if you look sort of across the aisle to the performing arts, as opposed to the creative arts, performing artists um, practice 8 or 10 hours a day, every day. Do you think that's fun? No, but they know that for the quality to be there when they go perform, that is, that is what it takes. And it's, if, somebody, if somebody's creativity is killed by doing that, they weren't a great artist. Anyone who has real artistic talent will thrive with that. It, rather than that be a ceiling, it becomes like a foundation on which they can stand that supports them, that leaves them free for their artistry to soar. They don't have to worry about doing, 
the basic things because it comes easily to them. They can focus their attention on the, the special little details that's what's going to make their art give it that special quality. So I am a great believer in technique. The more you work on your technique, the more your art can soar. I told you that he had a final thing on his list. And it shows what an insightful man he was. He said that the last thing you need is poetry. Now, isn't that beautiful? And it's saying you, you need for there to be something from deep inside you that is being communicated to the audience and that stirs them and provokes feelings in them and makes them think. If that is not there, it might be a great mechanical exercise, but it's not great art. That feeling has to be there. Curiously, you will not hear me talk about that in connection with what I try to do. To me, it's sort of like the dark matter of painting. I don't see it, I don't feel it, I can't control it. Either I'm communicating it or I'm not. I have no power over it. I, all I can do is while I'm attending to things I can see and do, that, that special feeling is somehow being communicated as well. So this, I, I will not be referring to it again, but it is absolutely fundamental. Somebody asked me once if when I painted, I was in some sort of state of rap inspiration. Those weren't the words she used, but that was what she meant. She was very disappointed when I said, actually, no, I'm not. The reason is that when you're painting, it's sort of like when you're driving. There are all these things you have to be looking out for and dealing with. And, and if you are in a state of rapture, you can't be dealing with these things. You would be surprised to know to what extent painting is about solving technical problems that come up. By problem, I don't mean necessarily something that you'll not figure out a way to solve. That would be an overstatement. But there are things that block you. And until you figure out a way around them, you're <coughs> not going to get anywhere. That takes me to another point. You would, if you look at these paintings, you're going to assume that everything you see was inevitably going to be there, and that it was all effortless. Nothing could be farther from the truth. All there is a backstory to all these paintings, and with some, it's quite long and very interesting. And there are many things that are there, not because they sort of landed there, but because due to technical problems, they have to be there. Or that was my choice for fixing technical problems. Let me, and I'm going to give you some examples relating to color. You instinctively understand that a painting needs to have a certain spectrum of colors, and you work to make sure that there, there's a good balance. Which, but at, at this moment, that isn't what I'm talking about. I am talking about um, a problem that I saw when I started painting Sojourner Truth, my very first one. I had never painted African Americans before, and I realized that there were certain givens that were being turned on their head. And the situation was this. I realized that when you're dealing with darker skins, you cannot have the background around the head be either a medium tone or a dark tone, because the person just gets swallowed up by the background. You don't want that. You want there to be a contrast for the, the head of the person to pop out from the background. The way I solved it, and every one of those 18 paintings you see 
I said to myself, I've got to be sure that I've got light colors behind the head. <laughs> Every one. I would look at a photograph and I would say, yes, but does that give me a light color to put behind the head? There were two where that was especially a problem. And the first one was Octavius Cato. He was um, a, a young scholar in Philadelphia and what we call today a civil rights worker, and who was murdered by white thugs on an election day after the Civil War. Uh, it would have been more historically appropriate to put him on it with a background of a red brick building. And that was what I wanted to do, and I tried. And this is what happened. It wasn't going to work. Um, I put that down as a base color on, on which to give the shape of bricks. It would have been even darker. It was just not going to work. And to my sadness, I found myself doing this. Instead of making the house brick, I made it a white clapboard house. It wasn't what I wanted, but it was just so much better as a painting because it made the head pop out. With, then the Sojourner Truth was also one. You see the, the um, background color, again, it, it just wouldn't have worked. And I said to myself, what can I do to make uh, the head come forward. And you have, when you're thinking of what devices you can use, you have to think in terms of historically correct things. So finally, I said drapery. Okay, drapery. This is the only painting I have ever done that has the head against drapery. And it was exclusively for that reason. And I filched this particular drape from a 17th century Flemish portraitist. But it, it, was, it gave it the color it needed. Most of the time, that is not the problem. Um, when I'm doing paintings, especially when I'm doing um, large paintings, and most of these are actually 30 by 40, the, the problem becomes having everything I need to paint a body of the size that I'm going to need for that. Um, by that, I mean um, I may have a photograph of a person that comes down to the waist, but because of the size painting I want to do, maybe I want to show him down to the hips. So it can become pretty elaborate, and I want to take you through a couple of, of the paintings that I did and, and bring you behind the scenes to all the things I had to do to, um, to be able to make the paintings. And we're going to start with a painting that was very simple and then I'm going to go on to one that was one of the most complicated I've ever done. This was the simple one. This is my final, my finished painting of W.E.B. Du Bois. This was the photograph that I had. And you look at it, and you are going to say, well, that's really got most, that's really all there, right? Well, n no. Take a look at the things I've circled. I can't paint what I can't see. And those were areas that I could not see well. I couldn't see the handkerchief. I couldn't see the cuff of the shirt, the, the uh, right hand. And the bookcase was just hopeless. That's the kind of thing I mean. So I needed to supplement that so that I could actually have details I could paint. Now that takes me to my friend Google Images. First, the background. I found, I happened to come across this, and I think that was something for when William and Kate were getting married. It didn't matter to me. I just liked the library. So I looked at it and I said, okay, I've got my library. Some things you think a lot, and some you don't have to because you have some other things to solve. That was fine, and I went with it. Here is 
you see what I was actually looking at. You can see that they're very blurred. Here you see a photograph of Winston Churchill. You might think I downloaded that because I admire Winston Churchill. I do admire Winston Churchill, but no, I just downloaded it for the handkerchief um, because it gave me details. Here I downloaded a cuff, uh, another cuff. Uh, here's uh, someone with where you can see more of the body. So. That is how I got those details. However, I still had a problem because I didn't have a good photograph for the lower part of this arm, plus the painting was going to go down a little bit lower than what that did. So that meant I needed to find someone to model for me for those things. And a colleague of mine very graciously agreed. And I took that photograph. That cleared up the two problem areas, uh, the arm that's in the pocket, the one that's holding up the glasses or whatever. And it gave me what I needed to take the legs down lower. You, this seems like a casual thing. actually that opens the door to one of the big things in my painting life. I need models all the time for things like this because of what I do and I, I explain the situations. Now, you might think, well, as an artist, you have access to people who can pose for you. No, I really don't. I mean, I don't keep a dozen people of different sizes, sexes, and ages living in my basement that can just come up on cue and be photographed and go back down to the basement. I have no advantage over you. So that means anybody who's around me for at least half hour might just get asked to post. Nobody is safe around me. Not family, not friends, not repairmen. <laughs> and you think that's hyperbole. Well, I want you to look at this uh, image, and I want you to look at this one. Okay. Now look. Those were both repairmen <laughs> who got asked to do something extra. And the one on top said to me, don't I look silly like this? And I said, whatever, put that into your head. Just keep quiet and keep posing. <laughs> so sometimes getting a painting done is not a function of working in a state of rapt inspiration. It's being able to talk your plumber into crouching on the floor and pretending <laughs> he's a runner. <laughs> So, and that, that was the finished portrait. And I told you this was the easy one. Hmm. This was Marian Anderson. She was one of the great voices of the 20th century. She was a contralto, and most of her work was on the concert stage. In 1939, she was invited to give um, a concert in Constitution Hall in Washington by the Daughters of the American Revolution. But then, in, in a, a disgraceful act that they're still apologizing for, they took it back and said she couldn't go. And that was, everyone understood that that was disgraceful. She had met uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was then First Lady, because she had actually been invited to do a concert in the White House. And when Eleanor Roosevelt heard about this, she was furious, and she said, well, Constitution Hall is private property, but as First Lady, I've got a few concert sites of my own I can show you that aren't very, aren't too shabby. And so she said, would you like to do a concert at the Washington Mall, which is the strip of land that runs from the Lincoln Memorial to the Capitol Building, and many famous activities had taken place in the mall. So that is where the concert took place. And this was it. Take a look. Wow. Thousands of people came, and hundreds of thousands of people heard the concert on the radio. 
So, if you are going to paint Marian Anderson in anything with any sort of representational background, you know, what can you say? That, that is, it has to be Marian Anderson at the Lincoln Memorial concert, no question about it. And then the practical problems start. This is a photograph of her at the concert. Do you think I can use that? No. So I started looking through photographs to see if I could come up, to, so I could find a, an image of Marian Anderson that I could use because the ones actually taken at the event just didn't work. And I was looking, I, I was ideally looking for something that would be a whole figure I could use. If worse comes to work, worse, I, would, I was happy to settle for a head. And I'm not joking, because a portrait succeeds or fails based on the head, as it should. And you need to have an excellent head to even think of doing a portrait. If you don't, don't even consider it. If you have a head, well, other things can be arranged for, but you need that head. So I looked through everything, and I decided that head would be good. Remember I said that no one is safe from being asked to model for me. My daughter has posed for more paintings of young women than I can tell you. And she very gamely agreed, and I said to her to please pose in a series of hand gestures that a singer would use while singing. She very nicely didn't say, no, Mom, I'm not going to make a fool of myself. She actually understood that it was a serious request. And I put, I put a fur coat on her, and these were some of the things. I wanted a bunch so I could pick from them later. So, looking at them later, I settled on this. And I told you that one of my best friends was Photoshop. Now we're going to see a little Photoshop magic in action. Voila. So, now I have Marian Anderson. One down, one to go. We still don't have a background. Oh, and this, uh, there are a number of photographs of what she was wearing, so that wasn't a problem. And I asked the Marian Anderson Historical Society what color was her top, and they said it's gold. Okay, so I had the color, so we were fine. Now we turn to what do we use as the background. Well, this was a picture of the real background. I'm not going to paint that. that. That's just not interesting. Um, here's another one. No, if I'm going to do a painting of Marian Anderson at the, the, the singing at the Lincoln Memorial, the background is going to be the statue of Lincoln, right? Lincoln looking down on her as she sings. Well, that presented practical problems, and you'll see why. Okay, there's, that is the, the scale of a person to the actual um, statue. And you can see that the person barely comes up to the halfway point of the base. Now, am I going to paint this and then and have to say to people, I know that looks like a blank wall, but it's really not. It's Lincoln looking down on her. You just have to use your imagination. No, you can't do that. So. I knew I was going to have to take some liberties with the real sizes of this so I could actually put the statue of Lincoln. That meant two things to decide. One, this, the actual size I was going to make the Lincoln, but another one, from what angle I was going to show the Lincoln statue. And that's actually more important a point then you realize, because if something is just head-on looking at you, it doesn't have a lot of energy. 
And if you look at my paintings, you will see that to a far greater extent, things are at an angle. That gives it a lot more energy. So it really made a difference from what angle I did the Lincoln Memorial. Here are some of the photographs that I look, looked at. And finally, I picked this. Now, remember, we have this. Well, now we have this. We, so, so we're closer to what we need, but there's something missing. Well, I'm missing the base because the photograph that I was using didn't have a base. So there I take out my large pads of paper and rulers and I, I go, to, um, uh, go, to, go to perspective drawing. I love perspective drawing. It is, to me, it's one of the great artistic achievements that those laws were actually found. This is the basis for it. And, and the, the basis is that, okay, if you have some of the lines that you need, you can take them back to a horizon line. And if you have that, there are a bunch of other lines you can make based on that. Like this one, you see the one here at the bottom, if you said, okay, there's something that lower the, than the horizon, but how much of the top are you going to see? If you just get a couple of lines, the perspective rules lets you put in the, rem the lines you don't have and actually come out with that. It's, to me, it's just, it, it is the most amazing ethical cheat sheet for art you can imagine. I used it, like I said, to turn this, to <clears throat> shift it around in here where it's a lot more angled and it was just an easy thing to do with the perspective drawing. So this is what I did. I don't know if you see the lines I drew. It actually goes a lot farther out because you need to take the lines out to where they hit the horizon. And if you just get a couple of them, then all the others fall into place. And at that point, we still had one final thing we needed to do. You needed to paint in the microphones because you don't, they're very slender and, and, and you need to have what's behind them finished before you put in uh, the microphone. So <coughs> using this and some other pictures, then I put them in and this is what, this was the finished product. But you see everything that was involved. Now, the story has uh, um, a final chapter I wasn't expecting. Um, six years after I painted the, this, I ran across on the internet uh, an article that the African American um, Museum in Washington had had the outfit Marian Anderson was wearing donated and they had her on special exhibit. And that in itself reflects how important this event was. And I was thrilled because I, I'd only seen it in grainy black and white photographs and here it was, it looked like it was bought at the store yesterday, it looked so fresh. So it was like time travel for me and I was so intrigued. But I looked at it and I said, that is not gold. Yeah. <laughs> They told me it was gold. I've been showing it to people as gold for six years. That is as distinct a shade of orange as a shade of orange can be. So I called the Marian Anderson Society people and I said, well, why don't we make some lemonade out of this lemon life just gave us? And I said, why don't you invite some people over and we can do an event, the artist live before all of you is going to change the color of the, the, the top to reflect what it really needed to look like. So they had an event coming up um, in a few weeks and they worked me into it and that's what we did and everybody loved watching me turn the top from gold to orange. Now I, I 
started this by talking about the people, and I want to end by talking about them as well. Again, they are remarkable people. They are people who can inspire us, and above all, they could be such great role models for the young people and for the young people most at risk. Because all of these were very talented people, yes, but all of us know very talented people who don't really do very much with their lives. These were people who came up from abject poverty. Some of them began their lives as slaves, and yet they achieved such great things. And the difference was their commitment to improving themselves, to making something of themselves, and get an education and work hard. They let nothing stand in their way. That is what a, a message we need to have conveyed to our at-risk young people. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to play a small part in trying to bring these examples to uh, the attention of more people. So with that, I want to thank you for coming. You've been a great audience. And um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. First of all, thank you. Oh, thank you so much.